Good evening. So nice to see you here. My name is Mark and I want to give you a hearty welcome this evening. I know that you've been enjoying the meetings. The presentations have been wonderful. It's encouraging to me to see you here coming out night by night. We've been blessed by the presentations by Pastor Torres, the Bible truths that are being brought out are wonderful to hear. We learned a number of interesting things last two nights ago when we heard about the validity, the credibility of scripture through the presentation of Daniel 2 and a very interesting presentation and we're thankful for that. Do you find the meetings encouraging or inspiring? Yes. Praise the Lord for that. Now, by now you know that we have just enough time for a quiz this evening and it will be over. The topic that we had last, and that would be Iraq and Bible prophecy, the study of Daniel 2. Are you ready? Do you have your quiz form? with you. So here we go. These are true and false. I don't have any extra credit questions tonight. True or false? Some dreams do come true. Second question. Nebuchadnezzar's dream points to the end of time on this planet. True or false? Number three, the image represented depicts only four ruling powers of the Middle East. Number four, the stone that is cut out without hands represents the coming of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Number five, we are living in the time of of the feet with the iron and clay. Okay, here we go. First question, some dreams do come true. Yes, and there's a Bible text with that, isn't there? Pastor gave an interesting story about a dream that he had that came true. Nebuchadnezzar's dream points to the end of time on this planet. True, at least uh, in the present age. Number three, the image represented in Nebuchadnezzar's dream depicts only four ruling powers of the middle, in the Middle East. How many does it depict? Five, huh? Number four, the stone cut out without hands. That one was false. You got it correct. The stone cut out without hands represents the coming of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's true. Number five, we are living in the time of the feet in regards to that image, statue, with down among the iron and the clay. True, that's right. By now you know that Pastor Lewis and his wife Carol Torres are here sharing the good news with us, bringing the, the scripture alive night by night. And haven't you been amazed at how the past, the present, and the future are related and uh, how he correlates them with a variety of stories. Uh, Pastor Torres is a worldwide traveler. He told me tonight that he's been doing this for 46 years. It's amazing, isn't it? And he goes all over the, all over the globe doing this. I was thinking on the way in, I wonder if he's on a first name basis with the TSA people. <laughs> We're so thankful that you're here giving your presentations, Pastor. 
<clears throat> what a privilege it is to have you and your friends here sharing God's word with us. Let's bow our heads at this time. Father, we are grateful that you have sent our way the scriptures that tell us about Jesus, about all that has been done for us. Thank you for using Pastor Torres and his team to make the scriptures clear. We ask now that the Holy Spirit would be among us to open our minds, open our hearts, to hear what the Spirit has to say. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. We don't always do requests, but tonight we're going to do one. We'll do a couple this time, uh, but tonight I would like to share with you the beautiful hymn, Day by Day. You'll find it in, your, in a hymn bowl up above in front of you, page 532, if you don't know the words. Tonight's subject is uh, one of those subjects highly important, and because of uh, the number of people around the globe who are committing suicide, guilt is one of those precursors that lead to that terrible outcome. 
people experience. And so tonight, how to get rid of guilt. We should pray as we open the word. Loving Father, as we spend time in, in your word tonight, we pray for your spirit to guide and to direct us. And thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture in the book of Revelation chapter 1 actually introduces us into this whole thing of overcoming. In fact, Jesus made several statements in chapter 2, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. The greatest thing that God desires is for his children to make it to the kingdom. And in order to make it to the kingdom, we have to overcome. But we have to overcome sin, which brings what we call guilt. And guilt is a feeling of having done wrong or failed in an obligation. And we have guilt because as individuals, human beings, we have a disease that the Bible calls sin. And it's revealed in Jeremiah 13 when it says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or can the leopard change his spot? What's the answer to both of them? No. Then it says, then may you do good that are accustomed to do what? Evil. Now, I have to be honest with you that, that there are people who uh, do not feel that they do any wrong. And so they do not feel that they qualify when the Bible says that they do evil. But evil is a relative term. And when God uses the term evil, it means evil. Even though we may think we're good people, the reality is that the Bible says, for all have sinned. How many? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, when I was just becoming a Christian, uh, I uh, came across one of my old musician friends uh, that we used to perform quite a bit together. And he discovered that I was becoming a Christian. So he took me over to meet his in-laws. His in-laws were Jewish. And when we entered into the house, uh, he was asking for the father of the home, who was supposed to be his future father-in-law. Well, they said, he's out in the yard. So he took me out to the yard, and there the man was sitting in a chair. And he's sitting there in the middle of the yard in this chair, and pretty hot outside. And uh, my friend introduced me to him, and he was very, very courteous. And then he made a statement when my friend said, and by the way, uh, he's interested in the Bible. And the man made a statement and said, I just want you to know that I do not sin. And frankly, I was not at all acquainted with everything that the Bible has to say about this subject. So I said, what do you mean? He said, you can, you can ask any one of my neighbors around here that I do not sin. I said, but what do you mean you don't sin? He said, I sit in this chair from sunrise to sunset on this day. I don't drink water, I don't eat, and therefore I don't sin. It happened to be the day of Yom Kippur, or what the Bible calls the Day of Atonement. And from his estimation, he did not, what? Sin. And by the way, his breath was strong enough that if I lit a match, he would have caught on fire. So, when you, when you think of this matter of sin, the Bible says that iniquity is what separates us. It separates us from each other. Isn't that true? As well as separates from God. But your iniquity has separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And so, God reveals that we have a, a problem, and God, of course, has a great problem. And the great problem is this. How can he separate sin from the sinner, destroy the sin, and save the sinner? Now, if you don't think that's a big problem, just look at yourself. 
Because sin is in you. Is what? So how do you separate that which is in you, remove it from you, destroy it, and at the same time save you? In fact, just to, you know, medical profession should be people who are the most religious. And I'll tell you why. Because they basically do that all the time with sickness. They try to the, to destroy the sickness that's in you so that the sickness is destroyed and save you. You understand? Have you ever seen it from, from that perspective? Physicians, they're looking at me. Hmm, they're saying. But the reality is this. That's, in essence, what doctors do all the time. If they're good doctors, that is. Uh, they are supposed to figure out what is inside of you that's ailing you and somehow either stop it or destroy it so that you can continue to live on. And that's the problem that God has, but God is dealing with something far more infectious than a disease he can get rid of. Because obviously, there isn't any medicine yet invented by mankind that can make you holy. And so, God reveals then in the book of Revelation that there's a process. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is found there dressed with a robe and a girdle um, around his chest. And this is the attire that normally was worn by the priests in the Old Testament. In a, in a service called the tabernacle service, or the sanctuary service. The seven candles that are around him, if you read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 and through 15, you see then that he's, Jesus is glorified. He is identified as wearing a priestly robe. And then it says that he is walking within seven candlesticks. Within how many? Seven. And it's interesting that the word seven, or the number seven, is found throughout the book of Revelation. Seven, seven, seven. Seven spirits, seven candles. So seven, seven, seven is found throughout the scriptures, especially in Revelation. It is significant of something. And so in order to understand this particular uh, allusion to the Old Testament, we have to go to the Old Testament. Because frankly, uh, outside of this particular description of Jesus being within the candlesticks, in the rest of Revelation, it mentions nothing about it. So the only place that you can find anything mentioned about seven candlesticks is in the Old Testament. So we go to the Old Testament. The Lord said to, the, to Moses and to the Israelites when he brought them out of Egypt, let them make me a what? A sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And so the sanctuary was to be a place where God would dwell. Remember this. The longing that God has is to at last be together with his children. But until that time, the plague has to be removed. So God had to uh, take planet Earth and quarantine planet Earth so that the disease could be halted here and taken care of here. So it is here that the healing will ultimately take place of this thing called sin. But in order for us to understand how God deals with the sin problem, how he wants to separate it from the sinner, destroy it, and save the sinner, we must study the sanctuary. So it says, and thou shalt make the seven what? Lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. Speaking about inside the sanctuary. So, there were several pieces of furniture in that tabernacle or sanctuary, and one of them was a lampstand. And the lampstand was to give light to the sanctuary, and this is why this lampstand is a type of Christ. A what? Now, I'm going to make a, a, a mention of a word, typology. What did I say? Typology. In the Old Testament, there are a lot of types that point to Christ. The lamb is a type that points to Christ. The lampstand is a type that points to Christ because the lamp gave light and Jesus said that he is the light of the world. That's correct. So when Jesus made those statements in the Jewish time when he was here, immediately the Jewish mind went to what? To the sanctuary. But to us, 
it doesn't make any sense because we don't have a sanctuary. And since most people don't study the Old Testament, they have no clue as to what those phrases really mean in reference to the Old Testament. So, let them make me a sanctuary and make a lap stand. So, here's the sanctuary, and I'm going to just show you a few uh, video clips of the sanctuary. The sanctuary actually had a court, which is the outside uh, curtains, and inside where that ark of uh, altar of, of sacrifice is, and it had the labor where they had to wash, and then they had the, the tent, which had two parts in it. So let me show you a picture then of the two parts. Here is another video. I, I hope you can see it well. And so we are going to take a, a flight into this place. If you notice then, uh, here is the altar of sacrifice. Here is the laver. And uh, when people went into the sanctuary, they had to go in through the opening here. And these were all curtains that were made. And then the person dealt with uh, the priest in this area. But over and into the tabernacle, the sanctuary inside, you'll find then that there's a table of showbread here. There's a lampstand here, the altar of incense here. And then there's a second apartment called the most holy place. So you have the holy place and what else? The most holy place. And inside the most holy place was the Ark of the Tabernacle or the Testament. The Testament. And there were two angels right on top of that Ark, the covering of it. And those angels represented the cherubims that stand in the presence of God up in the throne. So what God was doing was giving us a, a, a view of what's happening where? In heaven. And God was using a type. A what? A type. And that's what typology is, the study of types. Okay? So, here you have the ark. And between those two angels was called the Holy Shekinah, or the very presence of Jehovah, or God. And no one could go inside there except once a year the high priest could enter in. Otherwise, nobody could go inside because they, they, they did, they would die. Now, this ark here actually has, as I said, the covering, the two angels. But what's interesting is that inside this, this particular ark, there is what is called the table of stones. The what? Table of stones. Or the Ten Commandments. That's correct. So the Ten Commandments were kept right underneath the place where God actually dwelled in what was called the Holy Shekinah. Which means then that the foundation of God's government is what? The Ten Commandments. Now, this helps us to understand why the Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is what? The transgression of the law. So if you sin, you've actually gone against God's law. And just to break it down a little bit, not taking too much time, but if you steal, you have broken God's law. Not just man's law, but God's law. And by the way, most human laws that are enforced by authorities actually come from the Ten Commandments. Even though they don't give credit to it, the reality is this. For example, uh, here in, in uh, Oregon, you have a police department. And by the way, I used to be a chaplain with the, with the sheriff department up in uh, Washington County. And there, the purpose of the police is to curtail the violation of the law. And most of those laws are based upon the Ten Commandments. In other words, if you steal, then you're considered to be a robber and the police come and arrest you. If you kill, you're considered to be a murderer and the police come and arrest you. If you lie, uh, well, you can be in deep trouble if you are in court and you swear that I will t uh, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And if you lie, it's called what? Called perjury, exactly. So all of those laws are based upon what? The Ten Commandments. Isn't that interesting? So just as our government is based on the fundamental truths of the scriptures, 
uh, the command, the, the government of God is also based upon that. So here is another view of the sanctuary, but this time it's filled with people and with animals, okay? And so when people needed to take care of their sin problem, they had to bring their offering or sacrifice to the sanctuary. So here's the way it worked. Suppose that in the morning, uh, Henry got upset with his wife and said something he shouldn't have said. And later on in the afternoon, he realizes, oh, why did I do that? And so he goes and says, honey, I'm very sorry, forgive me for what I did. But that's not where it had to end. Because according to the scriptures, when you offend somebody, you really are offending the one who made that somebody as well. So you need not only to make it right with the person, you need to make it right with whom? With God. So the person then, Henry now, has a problem in his hands. He has a sin that he's committed. And he, if he wants that sin to get removed, he's going to have to do something about it. And he cannot just say, okay, I'm sorry, I did it. Now he has to get rid of it. And the way that they got rid of it is very interesting. They had to get an animal, a, a type. A what? A type. Because the wages of sin is death, and God did not want the sinner to die because God had made a provision that his son would die. But in, in the process, man had to participate in exercising his faith in believing that because God had established that process, if you wanted to get rid of the sin, you needed to go and do something about it. But until you got rid of the sin, there's something that took place in the conscience. And that's called what? Guilt. It's called what? Guilt. And you and I know that when we do something wrong, our consciences begin to what? Trouble us. And we begin to feel guilt. And the only way to get rid of guilt is to get rid of what you did wrong. All right? But how do you do that? Well, here's Henry. He's living among all of those Jews. And uh, suppose he's living out there in the outskirts of the, of the tent. And he, now he's walking through the encampment with that little lamb. And everybody's seeing Henry coming down with his little lamb. So what are they thinking? I wonder what he's done now. But it's not important what people think. It's important what God thinks. So he brings his lamb and he takes it where? He takes it into the sanctuary, okay? So he brings it in there and then he comes before the priest. Now the priest only serves the role of helping that sinner transfer that sin from him or offer him, okay? Did you hear what I said? So the priest is not the one that forgives. He is the one that facilitates. He what? He facilitates. And so when the sinner comes with the lamb, he is supposed to now confess to God with his hand laid upon the animal and his weight leaning on the animal, pressing his weight on the animal. And by doing that, it demonstrates then that Jesus, when it says, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the, of the world. Remember that? The actual word is carries the burden. What is it? Or the weight of. Okay? And so the Jew then, who wanted to honestly get rid of his sin and get rid of the guilt, he had to now lay his weight on the Lamb, and then he would have to take the life of that Lamb. So by confessing his sin... He, by faith, has transferred the sin from himself to what? To the lamb. So since the wage of the sin is death, then the lamb must die. After the lamb is slain, then the priest collects the blood and takes it into what is called the holy place. And so it is the blood that maketh what? An atonement for sin. So by collecting the blood from the lamb, the sinner then has transferred his sin to the lamb and now the, the lamb dies and now the priest takes that particular blood with the sin into the sanctuary. So now the sinner can go free. The sin has been transferred. You understand? 
And because it had been transferred, it's no longer on him. Now somebody's carrying the burden of that sin. Who is it? The priest. The priest now carries the burden of that sin into the sanctuary. Because ultimately, man cannot eradicate sin. God is the only one that can. What did I say? Ultimately, man cannot eradicate sin. It is only God that can do that. And so, when he does that, then he is free. And it shall be then when he shall be guilty. See that word? Guilty in what? In one of these things that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. And it was very important. You wanted to get rid of your sin? You made mention of what the sin was. You couldn't say, well, Lord, if I've done something wrong, forgive me. Because that's not admitting your fault. It is simply trying to cover it up by saying, if I've done something wrong. And I've heard in churches sometimes, people get up and say, if I've offended anybody, for, please forgive me. Well, it's true that sometimes you don't know if you offended somebody. But most of the time, what I've found as a pastor is that people are too embarrassed to admit that they did something specific. So they use that phrase to kind of cover up that they've done something particular. But they still want the forgiveness or the comfort of feeling that, all right, I'm forgiven. So they say, well, if, if I've offended anybody, please forgive me. You understand what I'm saying? But God wants you to, to specifically mention the particular sin that you committed to God. All right? Now, the wages of sin is death, as we know, and the lamb is the one that carries the burden after the sinner confesses it. And that lamb represented who? Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away. You see the phrase that does what? Taketh away. Which means then that the Lamb carries away the sin. From who? From the sinner. But those sins will not be carried away unless they are confessed. So it's important to confess, all right? Then the priest takes that blood and takes it into the sanctuary. Where? into the sanctuary. And there before the curtain, he sprinkles the blood. By doing that, he has now transferred the sin from the sinner to the victim or the type. And from the lamb then, in the blood, it is taken into the sanctuary and deposited in the sanctuary. Now the sin is where? In the sanctuary. And the sinner is free. He no longer has to feel guilty. Because he has made things right and he has confessed it to whom? To God. So my dear friend, if you want forgiveness, make sure that you confess it to whom? To God. And be specific. All right, now. Those sins kept on coming into the sanctuary day after day, day after day. I mean, you have three million people, you're bound to have somebody do something wrong, Right? And so they're coming day after day, day after day, day after day into the sanctuary, confessing, confessing, the sins are piling up. And the time comes then when that has to be clean. So the sanctuary has to be what? Clean. So all of these sins that are piled up need to get removed. The sins of the people have been brought to the sanctuary day after day. They have been accumulating or mounting up. So the question is, is God responsible for our sins? What's the answer? No. So how does God get rid of them? And that's the next point. On the day of atonement, one day a year, Yom Kippur, the day that the man was sitting on his chair and said, I don't sin, okay, Yom Kippur, they selected two goats. One was representing the devil and one was representing the Lord. So two goats, okay. And then they would cast lots. One for the Lord and one for the, for the Azazel, is what it was called. And once the, that decision was made, then the, the Lord's goat, which represented Jesus, was killed. Now, you may ask the question, why, why a goat went before the lamb? It's because be, as Jesus takes the sins of the world upon him, he becomes sin for us. And because he becomes sin for us, 
he is now looked upon as the goat. But fortunately, he only takes upon your sins upon him temporarily. What did I say? Temporarily. Because he's not the originator of sin. He only takes it off from you so that he can bear it and he can die for it because you cannot die for it. Because if you would die, there'd be no hope for you. So God made the provision that his son would take it, he would pay the penalty, and you can go free. Now that's good news, what do you say? Okay, that's the gospel. So now the goats. Now once the goats were selected, then one of the goats was killed, the Lord's goat, and the high priest, you notice he's, what, what is he wearing? What color garment? White. And what color garment was he wearing, Jesus was wearing in the book of Revelation? White. Okay. So, the high priest now, representing Christ, takes the blood from the goat and now goes into the very presence of God and sprinkles the blood over the commandments. Over what? Over the commandments, showing that the actual transgression is against God and his commandments. So every time you sin, it's not just against a person, it is actually against whom? God. And therefore, an atonement must be made and Praise God that he made a process by which he could take care of that. What do you say? And so here then is the gospel. The gospel was unfolded in the sanctuary. The Jewish people had the opportunity to understand the gospel. The process that God had by which the guilty could be set free and the innocent could die for the guilty. Thus transferring the sin from the guilty to the innocent setting the guilty free so no longer did he have to deal with the guilt and uh, the victim dying which is our lord now just to help you understand in today's language how many of you have computers any of you have computers okay how many of you uh find that sometimes you have to delete a file okay now when you push delete where does the file go <laughs> it goes to the what to the garbage can. There it is. So I took a picture of my laptop. I'm trying to get rid of a back cup of Bible inspiration. See that? And I, I uh, push the two fingers on my Mac. And it opens up this window. And it asks me, what do I want to do with that? I want to remove it to where? To the trash can. So then I remove it to the trash can. Right? Do you understand that? But question, is it gone? No. Where is it? It's in the trash can. It's still there in your computer. All right. So when you confess your sin to God and it comes into the sanctuary, where is it? It's still there until the garbage is removed. Until what? So the garbage is piling up. All right. It's the same thing. So finally, you put it to empty. The time comes when you have to do what? Empty the trash. All right. And this is when it gets removed. So technically speaking all right now it's like throwing away gouge you throw the garbage in your garbage pail all of you know etc right but it comes to the time in your house that the garbage must be what it must be removed from the house so you have it in the plexus bag you put it take it out and you put it outside right and now it's outside the house but it's still with you because you're still on your property correct and it is not removed until what happens? Until the dump truck comes and takes it away to where? To the dump place. All right. I'm just trying to help you understand that in the sanctuary, when people confess their sins, it remained in the sanctuary until the garbage had to be removed from the sanctuary. And that removal took place once a year. Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. And so then it says this, and the goat shall bear upon him. This is Azazel, the second goat that had not been killed. Remember, there were two goats. The first one is the Lord's goat. He's killed. The second one is still alive. The high priest then would come out of the sanctuary with all of the sins that have been brought into the sanctuary, and that was then laid upon that goat with the priest's hands. And as those sins were confessed over the goat then, 
the goat now has the load of sin. And because Azazel represents the devil, it shows us that ultimately the one who will pay for the confessed sins. Did you hear what I said? For which ones? For the confessed sins is the devil. But if you don't confess the sin, then you carry it yourself. And what God wants to do is not destroy you. He wants to destroy the sin. You must then cooperate with him. What do you say? All right. So the earthly sanctuary then had to be cleansed. But this earthly sanctuary also pointed to a heavenly sanctuary. But the question then is, when did the earthly sanctuary service come to an end? Because we know that it went year after year after year. And we know that when uh, in Daniel's time, there was no tabernacle. Because the temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And the Jews no longer had a sanctuary. So Daniel, if you read Daniel, you'll understand why he's praying. How long, O oh Lord, will you not uh, bring back the sanctuary? Because to Daniel... There was this process of getting rid of sins. And since there's that process is no longer there, then we're all stuck with our sins. So God, have mercy on us. When will you reestablish a sanctuary? Well, God said then that the sanctuary, the earthly one, would come to an end. And in Daniel 8, 14, it says, And he said unto me, unto, me, unto 2,300 days, then shall what? The sanctuary be cleansed. But notice it says 2,300 what? Days. Biblical prophecy, when, it's, when it says days, it actually equals years. It actually equals what? A year. A day for a year. And so then, that's Daniel 8.14. Okay, so then Daniel doesn't understand. In fact, he weeps because he doesn't understand. And the angel comes to explain to him what would take place with those 2,300 uh, days. And so, in chapter 9, then it breaks it down. 70 weeks of those 2,300 days apply to your people. Notice it says, are determined upon thy people. In other words, a, the sanctuary will be cleansed after the, at the end of 260 and 200, uh, 2,300 days. But part of that will be specifically applying to the Jewish people. So, and to thy holy city. To finish the what? The transgression and to make an end of what? Of sin. And to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So several things had to take place in this prophecy. But 70 weeks were specially allocated for the Jews. And so then the angel says, this is when that prophecy will begin. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Remember, that this is Daniel. And at that time, the, the temple had been destroyed. So the answer is, the temple will be restored again. You see that? Know it therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto what? Unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be what? Seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The three shall be built again and the wall, even the troublous time. So the prophecy was, Daniel, look, don't worry about it. The city will be built again, and the temple will be built again. But it'll take this much time. Now, Daniel uh, is anxious. But unfortunately for Daniel, he will not see the rebuilding of the sanctuary because he passes away. But God had given him the comfort to knowing that it will happen. The temple will be rebuilt. But it will be rebuilt starting at when the command to restore and to build Jerusalem is when the prophecy begins. And then after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be what? Cut off. In other words, the Messiah will come, but then he'll be cut off. But, uh, but not for himself. Who would the Messiah be cut off for? For you and for me. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. In other words, there'll come a time when the sanctuary again, it will be built, but then it will finally be destroyed. And, uh, but the Messiah is cut off for the people. Then it says, he shall confirm the covenant with many for how long? For one week, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and what? And oblations to cease. In other words, the, type, the types, the what? 
the type would finally come to an end. When Messiah is cut off, the types stop. What did that mean? Well, this, the prophecy was given, and the starting date would be 457 B.C. That's when the actual command to restore Jerusalem was given. And that's in Ezra chapter 7, verse 13. Now, Ezra chapter 7, verse 13, you remember, comes after Daniel, even though the book itself was placed before Daniel. Do you remember that? You remember that? Yes or no? Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther are books that happened during the Medo-Persian period. Daniel happened during the Babylonian period. So Daniel's book should have been before those books. And that's why some people get confused. But if you understand that, that the books were historical, were placed in one section, and the books of prophecy was put in another section, then you can say, okay, which one fits where? And then you can figure it out, okay? So Ezra then, it's, it gives the prophecy, uh, gives the actual command that was given to restore Jerusalem. And that would command was given in 457 B.C., okay? So now the clock begins to tick, the prophetic clock, because God gave a prophecy, and now we need to look for its fulfillment. The first part was the 70-week period. And you have to multiply the 70-week. Uh, the Jewish calendar actually had 30 days per month. How much? 30 days. Not like ours at 39 or 31 or 30 or 29. The Jewish calendar is, is the same. Every month has 30 days. So it makes it easier then to calculate. So what happened was that God is saying that Messiah would come in 27 AD. And when? 27 AD. And the question is, did Jesus begin his ministry in 27 AD? The answer is yes. <laughs> All right. Let's look at it. Uh, I have laid on you a day for what? For a year. Okay, Ezekiel 4, 6. And also Numbers 14, 34 says the same thing. 40 years you'll spend in the wilderness. But, you, but God said 40 days, which will equal 40 years, you'll stay in the wilderness. Okay? For a day equals a year in prophetic time period. So now we have the time click, clicking, right? The Messiah was supposed to then be... Uh, come at the end of the 69th week, which is interesting. So 457 then brings you all the way down to 70, uh, pardon me, to 27 AD. Now in Galatians 4.4, notice what it says. But when the what? When the fullness of the time has come. What time? The prophetic time. When the fullness of the time. Because the Messiah was supposed to come at the end of that 70 week period, pardon me, at the end of the 69 period, and then he would have more, one more week. So, what happened was that according to the Bible, the fullness of the time was come. And if you look at uh, Luke 3 and verse 1 and 2, it makes it clear that, that Jesus was baptized on the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which was exactly 27 AD. In other words, on 27 AD, according to Bible prophecy, Jesus did begin his ministry. When he was baptized. Okay. Now it's interesting because now you have one week remaining. So then it says in the midst of the week, the Messiah would be cut off. So if you have a week, how many years does that represent? How many days in a, in a week? Seven. So the midst would be what? Three and a half. So Messiah then was anointed by John the Baptist in 27 AD and began his ministry, but he went how long? For three and a half years. And then what happened? He was cut off. He was crucified. So he only did his ministry for how long? Three and a half years. That's what the Bible probably says. In the midst of the year of the week, the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. The Messiah would be cut off for you and for me. So when the priests were about to slay the lamb and Jesus was being crucified, when Jesus died, the lamb that was supposed to be slain it says that the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And that temple, that temple and the curtain was about 70 feet high. How high? 70 feet high. So when the curtain was torn in half, it was obvious that it was not any human being tearing that curtain. What did it represent? God himself brought an end to the earthly sacrificial service. That's why Christians do not celebrate 
Passover anymore because to offer a lamb would mean that you do not yet accept that the Messiah has come. And for the Christian, that's serious because it means then that you do not accept your Savior who died for you. So to keep celebrating those Jewish holidays would mean that you are rejecting that Jesus in verity was the Christ. So those feast days came to an end because they were typology. They were types that pointed to the Messiah. Is that clear? But listen. He shall cause the sacrifice and what? And oblation to cease. And in Colossians 2, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and took it out of the way, nailing it to what? To the cross. So what about the remainder of the prophecy then? Because you had 70 weeks now, so you got 70 weeks finished, but something happened. 70 weeks comes to 34 AD, and you have 2,300 days or years, which means then that the remainder takes us all the way to the time of 1844. To when? Time of 1844. So from 457 BC, you take 2,300 years, and it brings you to 1844. So the question then, why did God point to the cleansing of the sanctuary in 1844 when there is no sanctuary today? The Jews are hoping that they can build a temple, but they have a problem. They can't build it. Why? There's a mosque where the temple was. And they feel they cannot build a temple in any other place than where the temple was originally. So until something happens with that mosque, there is no temple. So since there is no temple, now, and by the way, I should tell you that all Jews, Hasidic Jews, Orthodox Jews, are laying jewels and silver and gold aside, waiting for the call to be made to rebuild the temple. The problem is that they do not understand that Messiah did come. They do not accept Jesus as the Messiah. Consequently, they're still waiting for a Messiah. Okay. Now, in 1844 then, we find that the sanctuary was cleansed. But where is that sanctuary? Since there's no earthly sanctuary, what is God speaking about? Notice what it says in John 1 and uh, 2 verse 1. And I see that the time is going, so I'm going to try to speed up. Uh, my little children, these things write I unto you, that ye what? That you sin not. And if any man sin, we have a what? An advocate with who? With the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So when Jesus died then, he died as the lamb. But when he rose, he rose as a priest. That's why in Revelation chapter 1, you don't see him as the lamb then. You see him as the priest. In chapter 4, it points to him as the land that had been slain. That what? That had been slain. But Jesus now is acting as the priest. So it says, For there is one God and one what? One mediator between God and man, and the man is who? Christ Jesus. So you have to ask, where is Jesus mediating then? Where did Jesus go when he went up? Where did he go? Do you know? It said he went to heaven. He promised, I'm going to my father's house. There are many mansions, and if we're not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. So while he's preparing a place, he's also doing what? He's mediating. He's what? Mediating. So if you sin, you have an advocate. What does the word advocate mean? Lawyer. So right now, Jesus is doing what? Mediating. Why does he mediate? Because you cannot defend yourself. You're guilty. You have to have a lawyer. But who was that lawyer? Christ. And the good thing about Jesus is that he's never lost a case. If you put your trust in him, you have a good lawyer. The best that the universe can offer. And you need him. But listen, where is Jesus doing his mediation? Notice what it says. For Christ has not entered into what? The holy places made with hands which are the figures of the truth. But into what? Heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for who? For us. So, 
in conclusion, how does one get rid of his guilt? Number one, by accepting that you have sin, if you indeed have sin. Sometimes the Spirit of God convicts us that we've done something wrong, but we're not willing to admit it. I think that sometimes husbands have a hard time admitting when your wife uh, kneels you and tells you you need to get it right. How many of your husbands uh, feel, do that? I see. <laughs> okay. All right. Some of the husbands are raising their hands. I'm guilty. Now, it's sometimes pride stands in the way. What stands in the way? Pride stands in the way. Self is there to defend itself. So it's very difficult to give in. So what happens is that you would rather defend self than to give up the sin. And unless there's a humbling of the heart, you will fight to preserve yourself. But in reality, you're not preserving yourself. You're destroying yourself. Because if you keep your sin, eventually it will destroy you. When Christ comes, he comes without sin, the Bible says unto salvation, which means then that right now you and I are in the judgment period of earth's history. When? Right now. 1844 has come and gone, which means then that for all the time before 1844, the work that was being done in heaven of mediation, all right, was like the work that the priest was doing in the earthly sanctuary coming into the holy place, coming into the holy place. But all these centuries, these sins have been what? Accumulating, accumulating, accumulating. And the time comes when God has to cleanse the sanctuary. But which one? The earth one pointed to the heavenly one. Therefore, when Jesus went to heaven, he went with his blood to represent us before his father. And as he's representing us before his father, he's anxious that we take advantage of that which God is providing. God is providing for you a substitute. A who? A substitute. But there must be a change in the heart. There must be a reality that you really recognize your need and are willing to turn to Christ to deliver you. It's very difficult, but it must be done. Right now, there's a heavenly hospital going on. The process of taking care of the disease is taking place. But the sinner must recognize his need to go to the physician. If he doesn't go to the physician, the heavenly physician can't do anything for him. We are living then in the judgment hour of earth's history. We must take advantage of the time that God has given us while the Savior is mediating for us. Because the time will come when Jesus will finally end his work of mediation. And once he leaves the heavenly sanctuary, that's it. There's no more atonement for sin. In other words, God has dealt with the sin issue for so long that he must finally bring it to an end, to a conclusion. And he's waiting for us, his children, to cooperate with him. So why hang on to the sin when you can get rid of it? What do you say? Why try to deny that you have a problem when God can heal you from the problem? Why try to keep that which is destroying you when God will heal you even though it may hurt to get rid of it in the process? The Lord is anxious for you and I to recognize that we are living in the last days, we are living in the time of the Day of Atonement. And when the sanctuary is cleansed, that will be it. And so tonight, Jesus is representing us. He is your heavenly priest. But you must claim him as your heavenly priest. You cannot come to him and, and say, like the young ruler, uh, what must I do to be saved? Keep the command. Well, I've done all these in my youth. And Jesus said, then sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And the scripture says that the young man couldn't handle that. He went away sorrowfully because he had much wealth. He didn't realize that while he thought he did all the right things, in reality, he had a God before God. 
And that God was his wealth. What was it? His wealth. And he turned away from Christ, the one who was willing to take his sins from him so he could have eternal life. Our friend, listen, it doesn't pay to hang on to that sin, whatever it is. The Lord wants us to give, to give us the victory, but we must be willing to recognize our need and to turn to our Heavenly Father in the name of Christ and say, Lord, I have sinned. Forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, purify me, and make me ready so that when Jesus comes, I can be there waiting for him. How many of you would like to offer that kind of a prayer? What do you say? Oh, Lord, when Jesus comes, I want to be there. That's why some songs have been sung like, Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number when the saints come marching in. has to do with the, the understanding that the person had that they wanted and needed to be among the saved. Not just think that they could be there, but accept it. So right now we're in the process of the heavenly sanctuary being cleansed and as it says, and almost all things are by the law pursed with what? With blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. In other words, the earthly sanctuary was cleansed with the blood of goats, but the heavenly sanctuary must be cleansed with the blood of Christ. Christ paid the price. The hour of his judgment has come, according to Revelation 14, 7. And we must take advantage while we can. How many of you tonight would like to say, Lord, when my name is brought up, please represent me. How many of you would like to stand to that and say, Lord, I want you to represent me. I want to be sure that there's nothing in me that is still in me when the sanctuary finally in heaven is closed. But that everything is made right between me and you. And Lord, help me. And God promises that if you do, ask for help and he will render it. Let's pray. Loving Father, we're grateful for your precious word and for the process that you have created so that we poor mortal sinners can find the relief from our guilt because we have gotten rid of that which brings the guilt, our sins. And thank you that we do have a high priest, that we do not have to go to an earthly priest to confess because those cannot eradicate sin. You only are the one who can do it. And so we claim your blood, dear Jesus, in our behalf tonight, we stand to let you know that we desire for you to be our advocate when our name comes before the judgment. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.